that Arnold Classic that you were disqualified. There's a 1990. Okay, That's not the 80s. 1990. Okay. All right, 1990. The first one was an 89. Right. One. So, so the first one, they so that first title, you okay, okay. So it was 90, okay. And and, and I've heard your analogies about how you basically got you reaped. You, you got you got all you know you got all the the media, you got all the the, the, the accolades, and by the time I think it was was it Mike Ashley, right. You know, he basically got, you know, his award mailed, you know, it was like there was no hoopla about it. But a lot of people, though, look at that DQ that you took, and then they look at Jay Cutler some, maybe, what, 10 years later, maybe 13 years later, and uh, I I really kind of want to kind of, like, pick your brain as to why you you, uh, accepted it, because I've heard that Jay – sort of threatened that he might go the lawyer route and, and was it, maybe it's a different circumstance. I don't know, but why did you accept it? Why did you not say, no, I won, you know? Yeah. Ironically, you started the conversation off about Joe Weider and what it felt like to have a relationship with him. Joe Weider called me. Hmm. I mean, the first call was from Wayne Demilia telling me I failed the test. Then I get a call from Joe Weider. Um, actually, I think I called him. I called Joe. I said, like, basically, what am, what am I supposed to do here? Um, and Joe was the one that reminded me that I had won the Pro Ironman the week before. And that's what qualified me for the 1990 Olympia. <clears throat> um, and he said, you're qualified for the Olympia. We're going to test there. Make sure you pass the test. Uh, I'm thinking there's going to be this avalanche of negative publicity, like uh, Ben Johnson style, right? Like on the cover of Sports Illustrated saying busted, looking like a big cheater. I think the culture of our bodybuilding uh, industry back then was everybody knew everybody was using something on some format. I mean, even the natural guys, that nobody even believed Mike Ashley was natural. So you hard pressed to convince people that Mike was, was natural. Samir Benu failed the drug test that week, that year. A lot of guys, there's, I think there's five other athletes that failed the drug test, but naturally being the winner, spotlight was on Sean Ray. Being 23, 24 years old, um, with options, I might add, I, I knew that WBF was coming. They, they launched in September of 1990, but I knew they were, it, it was in the inception so by them failing me at the drug test, and mind you, I, I, I was as natural as I could be. It was a water-based drug, feed, same drug that Ben Johnson failed the test. It's not something that gets you big, something that gets you hard, something that, to, to help you with your conditioning. I had stopped that in, in January. So three months later, a water-based steroid shows up in my system, and I was just as surprised as anyone else because no one knew how we were going to, get the results back or how they were going to be handled. When this information came to me, I went straight to Joe Weider, and Joe said, well, you're already qualified for the Olympia. We're going to be testing at the Olympia. Make sure you don't fail the drug test. So you can imagine for me, I'm under contract with Joe. My concern wasn't, can I get in shape for the Olympia? My concern was not failing a drug test. So naturally, from that moment on, I wasn't messing around with anything. I was too afraid. I was, I was afraid I was going to lose my career if I fell two times in a row. And I'm the smallest bodybuilder up there next to Steve Brisbois. Olympia comes around. I pass the drug test, and I wind up in third place. It seemed like everything was forgiven. A um, couple guys failed the test there. We talked about that at nauseum. Uh, Barry DeMay never took the stage. He failed the test. Dan Walcott-Smith. Vince Comerford, and, of course, Vince Taylor, which is a very little-known thing because Vince said he was cramping, (laughs) which, uh, ironically, you get to the Mr. Olympia, you know cramping can go away in a matter of minutes, right? But he couldn't make it to the stage and couldn't compete, so he he bowed out. I think maybe the drug test could have scared him off. Um, And Mohammed Ben Aziza failed the drug test that weekend. 
The difference, they got the test back before they took the stage, so we never saw them compete. I passed the test. I moved up to third from 13th place in 1988. And now I'm really feeling my oats because I'm going to go back to Columbus, Ohio in 1991. Ironically, they decided to throw all the drug testing out by 1991. No more steroid testing. It was gone. Just vanished. Um, so I redeemed myself by moving up to third place and passing the drug test. When, when it came down to me, I had Joe telling me, don't worry about it. With Joe telling me not to worry and him writing my check every month and controlling the media machine, what argument was I going to have? I was going to go fight for $60,000 for what? Sample B that probably was going to test positive too for a drug I knew I'd taken. So you didn't get an argument out of me. Jay Cutler, on the other hand, in 2001, failed the diuretic test because that was started after Mohammed Ben Aziz had died in 1992. They didn't want bodybuilders dying. And so they wanted to protect them from themselves. And the diuretics were more deadly and dangerous than steroids. So they brought in this, the diuretic testing. And a little note, little sidetrack there, in 1996, Master Elson Body was third in the Olympia in Chicago, failed the drug test. They didn't give him his money, and he never got uh, acknowledgement. Everybody behind him moved up. He was dq the difference is they got the test result back after the show. So everyone thinks Nasser was third in 1996 in, a, in, a, in a Chicago, but he was TQ. <clears throat> he didn't make a stink out of it. He didn't make an argument. So, no, so it went away as fast as it ha happened. Jay's uh, drug test came back dirty, and they had talked to him about uh, that it was dirty, and he threatened a lawsuit. Because of the handling of the steroid, or the, because of the handling of the, the urine after they took the samples, and Wayne Demilia didn't want the negative publicity, so he didn't make a big deal out of it. I knew it. All the other athletes knew it. Jay was second. You take Jay out of the way, I move up from fourth place in 2001 to third place in my final Olympia. I didn't make a stink of it because by that time I was done. Thankfully. I, di I didn't want to do it anymore. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to be a part of the Ronnie Coleman victory lap. And Ronnie went on to win, I don't know how many more times, uh, five, four or five Mr. Olympias after that. But because you didn't have anyone arguing about Jay failing this, the diuretic test, it fell flat and it disappeared. And, 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 you know, and again, I, I think that goes back to the immense power. I don't think people will realize how much power Wayne D'Amelio actually wielded in those days to make a call like that. Uh, I, I would say that he was quite, quite powerful. Um, going back to uh, after your first Arnold win, after your DQ, how aggressively, because we've been throwing around the acronym here a little bit, WBF, how aggressively did the WBF come after you? Was I would imagine, especially, you know, as they say, you know, sharks see blood in the water. I'd imagine the second you got DQ, you're probably getting, you know, bombarded with calls from Tom Platts and people like that. Uh, did they come at you real aggressively, especially after that DQ or, or at all during the, the run of their shows? It was, still, it was still in the infancy stages. So that was March of 1990. They made the announcement that they were formulating a magazine in 1990 at the Olympia, where I got third. And then they went into a bodybuilding federation. It came out like a month after that. They're going to create their own bodybuilding federation. It wasn't until they got to that level that they contacted me and all the other athletes to come fly to Hartford, Connecticut, Stanford, Connecticut, to the headquarters of the WFBF and sit down with this man. So they did. They, they bought me a first-class ticket on Grand Am Air, which was nice because I'd been flying around already, and, and I wasn't flying first class. So here I got this new federation. Tom Plass is the spokesperson. They booked me on a first-class ticket to go meet, meet Vince McMahon. And Vince was famous. You know, I mean, the WWE was big. 
Was it WWE back then or was it WWW? WWF, I believe, is what it was. But yeah, World yeah. Wrestling Theory. So I walk in. I sit down. I meet, you know, Shane, his son, trained at Gold's Gym in Venice. And he, he was a fan of mine. Um, I mean, I do the whole spiel with those guys and I come home and it wasn't, it wasn't like the offer, the dollar amount was right then and there. It was just an introduction. We all went down, we met them and they get back to me and they offered me $225,000 for the first year um, and 250000 the second year. That was a shit ton of money. I mean, that would have paid the house I was living in off. I would have been done. That would have made that 60000 I lost disappear. Um, I wanted to be Mr. Olympia. And when I put everything together, what I was going to give up was all of my worldly travels independently that I was doing on my own, all my videos that I was making, my pictures, my T-shirts, my posters, Sean Ray Productions, which I started in 1987. They absorb all of that because now they can sell my image and likeness and promote, and they get the money. That's how they recoup it. So they also said that they were going to put us in potentially in movies, potentially in promos, uh, but we wouldn't have to travel anymore. We wouldn't have to fly around and guest post. But if, if they wanted us to, then we would have to do it for them and we don't get paid. So I'm calculating in my head that I may be flying all over the place making the kind of appearances I'm making, but I'm not going to be paid for it because it's absorbed in my monthly check. And a monthly check when you're making $225,000, pretty big. You get a check like that coming, we were in a recession in 1990. So going back, I, of course, I went and talked to Joe because that's the first call I made and talked to my family. And Joe basically said, look, they're going to do this and we don't know how long they're going to do it. We've been doing it and we don't have any plans to go anywhere. So you can go for the big money on a short term or stay with us for the long money and get security. You're world, you're world famous. So you go with them, you're going to be their famous. They're going to make you as famous as they want you to be. And you're not going to be Mr. Olympia. <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. I, I chose to stay. I think I served myself well. I didn't get into bodybuilding for money. And I said it back then, money comes and goes. I got into bodybuilding to try to be the best Sean Ray could be. And to a person in the WBF, they all got worse, with the exception of Gary Stride. I, I don't know if you were done on that, but just to jump in, the thing with WBF, though, and I don't know if it was it was apparent when you were, you know, when you went over there, when like they were like announcing everything they were doing, but it seemed like their guy was Gary Stride. That's who was. And that was a problem. That was a problem for me personally. And it was a problem because I just beaten Gary Stride, and he was getting in the line. He got a three year contract, right. at four hundred thousand a year. And we were nowhere close to those numbers. And so that's really, for me, what was the deal breaker. Because they didn't want to hear my argument. I'm still thinking I'm the best of the group that they have. And they're still trying to convince me that this is a show. And we could do more with Gary because he's bigger. And I'm like, he's bigger, but he's not better. And no, so and I, I, and I, you know, and I, and I don't want to get myself sued, but I... For marketing, you know, uh, I, I feel like there might have been some, in their eyes, their marketing, you know, like, like I think something similar happened with Gunter Surkamp when he hit the scene too. Bob Perry, do you know, I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I, I got to be careful oh, about how I course. say it, but I, I feel like there was a little bit of that going on there. There was a lot of that. Yeah. I don't want to say it, but I we all no, know. I mean, there was a lot of it. Listen, they had Aaron Baker, they had Tony Pearson. Um, and then the rest of it was uh, Gary Stratum, uh, Jim Quinn. Uh, Mike Quinn. Yeah, my, Jim Quinn, Mike Quinn, Vince Comerford, David Dirk. They didn't have the great bodybuilders, um, and they didn't have to throw a lot of money at them. But the good ones that they had, like Mike Christian, Mike Christian was a great move for him. He wasn't never going to move into Mr. Olympia. Mike made $600,000 in two years, but it ruined him, you know, because he had some other issues he was battling. And it ruined a lot of those bodybuilders because they were given a lot. So to whom much is given, a lot of is, is required. And mm -hmm. when you get free money and you have a lot of free time, 
There's no reason to get out of bed when you're sleeping on silk sheets. You know, they, they, they took away their motivation. It took away the drive to go and earn their money. And it took away the drive to be the best that they can be because it didn't matter what they looked like. They were still going to get their check, and they did. And all of those guys, with the exception of Aaron Baker, got worse. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think what really killed the WBF was drug testing. You know, that first year they looked pretty good. That second year they looked like garbage. And the only one that looked really good that second year was Gary Stratum. And a lot of those guys say he wasn't even tested. So, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. And you can see that. And so that's a problem. Um, and they didn't have a farm club. They didn't have an amateur farm club to grow into the WBF. And they didn't have a tour set up for these guys to take it on the road to generate revenue. You can only burn so much money. And, and it was they were bleeding money on their magazine. They were bleeding money on their product. They started something like IcoPro or something like that, mm. some supplements. So it was a losing proposition. Great idea. It, it was better for us because it made Joe Weider dig deeper into his pocket to take care of those that were loyal to him. 